our next speaker is actually two speakers. So I get to do two introductions and then they'll get up here and do their thing. Um, we have Emily Sweat. She's an archeologist in the Bitterroot National Forest in Hamilton, Montana. Prior to working with the Forest Service, Emily worked with the Bureau of Reclamation in Nevada. Nevada, Nevada? Nevada. 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 Yeah. <laughs> Oregon, Oregon. <laughs> Uh, and then we also have Matthew Worley. He's the Heritage Program Manager for Bitterroot National Forest and has worked on Bitterroot for six years. Uh, Matthew has also worked for the Bureau of Reclamation and the Bureau of Land Management in Nevada and Idaho. Uh, Matthew holds a BA in Anthropology from San Diego State and an MA in Anthropology from the University of Montana. So we have uh, MSU and Montana next to each other. <laughs> All right, so uh, please welcome uh, Emily and Matthew. Thanks. So hi, as you mentioned, I'm Matt. Uh, bear with us. We're going to kind of do a handoff back and forth here with our presentation. And we wanted to talk to you a bit today about mid 20th century. So moving past uh, Ehlers time, we'll kind of briefly go over that period and talking to you today about the bitter controversy that kind of occurred really in the late 1960s, early 1970s, and has just really recently come to uh, our awareness of its significance, I think, um, in natural resource management and in the history of the Forest Service. So the Bitterroot National Forest is located in western Montana. <laughs> The Bitterroot National Forest is located in western Montana in the Columbia River Basin. Uh, our terrain is pretty steep. Uh, if you ever hiked out there, some of those trails can be pretty brutal. And so in the uh, 40 Years of Forest, or Ehlers mentions that the, he really envisioned the, uh, the Bitterroot National Forest as a recreational focus forest. It wasn't ever designed to be a big timber producer. It just didn't have the landscape for it. The valleys basically was uh, Lake Missoula, and you've got extremely steep, glaciated valleys coming into the west side that creates that picturesque um, mountain front. And so early on, you know, we had Anaconda Mining Company coming into the valley. Marcus Daly and the Daly Mansion is located just outside of Hamilton. And we really saw extreme amounts of resource extraction and timber production. Uh, this is typified, you know, by uh, Dr. Fiji's presentation and talking about all the extreme resource extraction that happened during that time without any really check or input or consideration for other resources that might be present. So forest management practices in the early days, so pretty much from 1900 to 1937, are a little bit more conservation focused than what we will see later on in our presentation. So you'll see here, uh, the photo on the left in the middle is of the Lick Creek Managed Forest District. This began in uh, 1905, and we'll see that photo there is from 1909. So this was the Forest Service's kind of attempt at selective harvesting to see, you know, from a research standpoint, how Ponderosa pine tree stand would react to selective harvesting. In the middle, you'll see uh, another photo from 1927, the Lake Creek Managed Forest District. You kind of see the difference between 1909 and 1927. So Lake Creek's really important, and it's something that also happened here on our Bitter National Forest. It was the first contracted timber sale. Uh, they worked with the Anaconda Mining Company uh, to do the selective harvest that you see here. Um, and then it also established a photo point project that's still in existence to today. Uh, they mapped very precisely every location where they took photographs and then continued to do that on at least a decade basis. And so our research center up in Missoula, they continue that process. And it's one of the things that we can utilize as far as visually showing some of the effects of things like the 10 a.m. policy that Dr. Fiji covered so well um, and that understory growth and how the forest and its health has changed. So, you know, between 1937 and 1942, the Forest Service overall started to acknowledge other resources and their values. Uh, recreation, 
fisheries. Um, there was an increase in people who had the uh, means to go out and visit the forest and other voices started to come out. It was still an early time, timber production, timber harvest was still the central focus. But during this period, um, we started to see an emergence of what will come later. And then in the background, we've got uh, the Deep Creek uh, Civilian Conservation Corps camp. So many of the facilities that still exist on the forest, including this cabin, Lost Horse, listed on the National Register, uh, was constructed during that time period with assistance and labor from the Civilian Conservation Corps. So in 1941, uh, timber production was mainly focused on ramping up uh, in an effort to help with the war effort for World War II. Uh, so Congress kind of passed a certain uh, amount of timber had to be produced by each forest. So we see a more aggressive timber harvesting practices. You will see this log jammer here, uh, which is loading a bunch of logs. Yeah. So each year Congress sets for each individual forest a timber target, and that's the amount of board feet that they're expected to extract. It's, it's one of the few metrics that Congress actually measures of the Forest Service. Um, we have many other laws, executive orders and regulations, but that's the one that continues to be the one that Congress you know, wants to see. So it gives a preeminence to timber extraction um, that you know other resources have to work around. And so to meet that demand, the Forest Service started brainstorming. How do we do this? And especially in an arid Western environment with large ponderosa pine that take 50 to 100 years or longer before they reach a point in which they might be merchantable timber. And one of the issues that they had was after they went in and harvested an area, when they replanted, seedling survival rate was extremely low, 30% or less. And so they were trying to come up with an idea of how can we continue to harvest and meet these congressional mandates, um, but ensure that there will be trees to cut in the future, thinking ahead. And so looking at timber as strictly from a commodity standpoint, as a crop, um, a very narrow vision, uh, they came up with terracing. And uh, you can see the effects of it. It's a clear cut area in which a small bulldozer here. Um, and there, if you can see, there's a gentleman in the back here planting seedlings. So after it was clear cut and harvested, uh, a small bulldozer would create these terraces and then a person would plant. And the idea was they would create a step environment that would help retain water and soil and give those young seedlings a better chance at survival. So uh, the forest managers from Bitterroot National Forest got the idea for terracing from the Boise National Forest, and this was happening across the country. But they went to the Boise to identify whether or not this was a successful technique, and they did, which is why we began to do it. So you'll see here on this map uh, our different ranger districts. Uh, we used to have four, now we have three. It's confusing. Uh, so up at the top is yellow, that's our northernmost ranger district, that's Stevi, and then in the pink in the middle there is Darby, and in the blue is Sula, those are combined now, and in the really hard to see purple, that's the West 40, and that's where we're going to be focusing today's talk. So right here, where this red square is, uh, is the Took Creek and Blue Joint drainages. The terracing that occurred in these two drainages are really the point focus for the Bitterroot controversy. So we'll see, and we'll see there on the bottom left photo, uh, Senator McKean and Guy Bramberg, who we're going to talk about in a minute. Uh, they're right there on one of the Took Creek drainages talking about terracing. So I could take a moment to talk a little bit about Guy Brandberg. He was kind of the second wave after Ehlers. Um, he wasn't one of Pinchot's boys, but really came to be forest supervisor on the Bidu National Forest during that 1930s uh, conservation era. Um, and as he retired uh, and still a resident of the Valley, involved with a lot of different things in the community, 
he became to be concerned. He saw what was going on with this terracing and it just was so much against everything that he had practiced and really felt that he saw all of his life's work being upended um, by this shift. And so he started speaking out, working with uh, folks like Mark Burke, a journalist with the Missoulian, who started publishing articles talking about the controversy. And there really became a local outcry as well. Uh, folks within Darby, which was a logging town at the time, the loggers started to be concerned about the rate at which the Forest Service was cutting trees because they said, there won't be anything left for my sons or my children to log and this industry won't be able to perpetuate itself. So we started to get more public outcry and eventually senators like Lee Metcalf and Frank Church get involved and start inquiring about what is going on the Bitterroot and what is going on nationwide on the Forest Service with this terracing practice. Now, I should mention another thing too about some of the ideology behind terracing. Um, the thought was very much, so they were clear cutting timber now and then doing the seedling planting. It was the idea that they would have future yields that were going to be so great that they could do more acreage of cutting now. So it was kind of a borrow from Peter to pay Paul situation. Well. Everything's going to be so great. These seedlings are going to survive. So we can start doing larger and larger areas until a point where the public's, you know, really started to clamor out and saying, this needs to change. Want me to go back? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. So besides uh, Brandy and Dale Burke, uh, Arnold Boulay, a professor from the University of Montana, he's actually the head of their Department of Forestry. Uh, he was asked by Senator uh, Metcalf to conduct the Boulay Report, which was an investigative report regarding the Forest Service's management practices and timber harvesting techniques, specifically focusing on clear cutting and the terrace landscape. You'll see two very interesting quotes. Uh, so we did conduct an oral history for this project. Uh, and one from the top up there is from Ron, Ron Scott. He was one of the district rangers in the Monongahela National Forest who also experienced uh, quite a bit of trouble with terracing. Uh, and then at the bottom is actually a quote from Arnold Bollet, who was interviewed in 1989. So initially, the Bollet report was seen as quite the critique of Forest Service management practices. It was not met uh, with very understanding approval from anybody in the agency or anything like that. But Boley never meant this to be some type of condemnation of management practices, more of a constructive treatise to say, hey, this is what's been successful about terrorism, and this is what else you need to look at and how this may impact other resources. So the bitter controversy uh, came about <laughs> following the Boley report. Uh, you'll see uh, once it's published, Senator Church and his colleagues actually conducted a congressional hearing regarding the terrorism on the Bitter Road. So all of this culminates in the enactment of the National Forest Management Act in 1976. In 1974, uh, a ruling was made um, in lieu while they were working on passing of this act. So here we have something centered on two little drainages way out in western Montana in a fairly rural area, and it culminates into, you know, a, an act of Congress and changing how the Forest Service still to this day um, has to comply with this. Every forest management plan, which is a document which guides how the forest will not only harvest timber, but taking account other resources and conduct resource management um, it is part of the National Forest Management Act. It sets standards by which uh, timber sales were to be conducted to take into consideration the effects to fisheries, watersheds, soils, silviculture, all of the ologists and the, and the resources that are present and work uh, with the Forest Service, and then in addition to working with the public, right? Like, because from the early standpoint of the Bitterroot controversy, the agency wasn't listening to its locals who were saying, this is affecting, you know, I don't want to see this unsightly mess on the side of the hillside. This affects my viewshed, my property values. 
Um, it's putting excess sedimentation in the water, you know, that comes down through where we live. And it wasn't taking those things into account. So this is one of the things that gave new direction and it continues to affect how we manage resources today. <clears throat> So in this photo to the right, you can clearly see the impacts of terracing on landscape today. So this was taken just this past July when I was out there looking at some of these terrace units. Uh, so for a long time, the Bitterroot had a conundrum. How do we manage the terrace landscapes? Because the machinery that they used in the 60s to conduct and create these terraces was extremely small compared to what we're using today. Uh, one of the biggest issues was the soil damage that had occurred when the terraces were constructed. So in the early 2000s, uh, the soil staff officer went out and conducted a soil uh, productivity uh, report to kind of determine what the situation really was. Uh, we actually found that the soil was not completely destroyed and it wasn't as deteriorated as we had initially thought. And there had been some regeneration uh, naturally with some of the soil and we saw some vegetation coming back, which kind of led to us being able to prepare uh, a new management for these areas. And so really one of the things that kind of outcome of the controversy itself was Nobody want a uh, forest service ranger didn't want to go in and touch these areas <laughs> because it was just a hotbed. So we, we just kind of took a hands off. Well, when they constructed them, the idea was that the eighties and nineties and early two thousands, about 30 years after all these different plots were planted for to go in and do a secondary harvest and to thin it again, thinking of it sort of like a garden where you thin uh, through your garden. So you can see these dense rows of trees all next to each other. Now that just sets them up to be prone to disease. Um, if fire comes through, it can go from tree to tree very quickly and they're competing against each other. So in, in some sense, while well, the terracing was obviously clearly a very harmful action, the non-management of it also set up a situation where you know, future management likely needed to occur. And so, you know, we're, Operating in the West, everyone's aware with you know the increasing size of wildfires and drought, climate change being a factor where we have uh, more acreage burned per year. And this is a breakdown of by month of what time of the year that that happens. The orange line is showing from 1984 to 2001, how many acres were burned reaching you know, 800,000 and then 1.6 million, so nearly basically doubling in size during the 2002 to 2020 uh, period. And then here we're just showing as well, so they measure within a fire, the intensity of areas that burn. So when a wildfire occurs, it doesn't create a solid blanket burn, um, you know, like a, you would think of a campfire. It's It burns within pockets and avenues and so, Earlier in periods, you see more lower intensity, low or unburned it fuels within the boundaries of the fire. And then as we progress forward, we see higher and higher high intensity burn, which devastates soil chemistry. Uh, it just causes a much longer period in which an area takes to recover. And so the Forest Service came with the plan, you know, this is a lot where our involvement initially began with going back and looking at these areas that were terraced and what sort of management needs to happen um, within these areas that were terraced. You can see the dents within these four, these are four different implementation areas. And then within that, all the spaghetti of roads, you can see that's all a product of terracing. Um, it's one of the most densely roaded areas on our forest. Um, which, you know, is, is a management concern. There's a large amount, you know, Blue Joint and Took Creek are going to be right here in this uh, Nesmud management union. So in trying to take a more modern view of it, the Forest Service is looking at mechanical, commercial, non-commercial, and addition prescribed burning within these areas. It comes from a long series. We have the National Environmental Protection Act to comply with, which guides public comment, public scoping periods, 
Um, and then we have an implementation plan with this project to meet with local communities, to consult with tribes. That's something that we are heavily involved with, to gather input and try to get to a community-based solution to how do we manage these areas and these lands. And so part of that, we go, well, these terraces are now 50 years old. And if anyone's familiar with the National Historic Preservation Act, as an archeologist, I go, oh my gosh, what do I do with this? I had foresters coming to me from other forests. I heard about you. You're that guy that wants to make the terraces eligible for the National Register. And I was kind of becoming infamous um, throughout it. And I said, well, you know, if it's not eligible, there's two books written about it. There's an act of Congress passed about it. If it's not eligible for the National Register, I don't know what is. Um, it's pretty significant. That's the main question behind National Register. Is it significant at a local, state, national, or regional scale? Yes, 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 and yes. So um, we had to come up with a game plan of how we were going to deal with that. And so um, the National Historic Preservation Act uh, is basically an act that gives both Emily and I uh, our positions where we're reacting, we're responding to things that the agency wants to do. And we're going out and trying to identify and evaluate for significance, heritage resources, archeological sites, buildings, traditional cultural properties on 1.6 million acres of federal land. Um, just a small area, just, you know, we've got a couple other helpers now, so it, it's getting easier. Um, and so when we have something that we can't avoid affecting in a negative way, then we have to come up with plans to mitigate for that. And one of those things that we said in our, we, we consult with tribes again under NHPA, we consult with the State Historic Preservation Office, which is part of Montana Historical Society. Um, and we sit down with them and say, okay, what, you know, what can we do with these terraces? Like there needs to be management action for forest health, there's a lot, a lot of, uh, I can back up here. So the private roads along here, I've seen a large number of homes have moved in. So this is a threat to people's homes, um, communities. What, what can we do? So some of the areas were identified, uh, you know, for a selective harvest, non-commercial treatment for, uh, that's basically using hand tools, chainsaws, a lighter touch on the ground, uh, there's other options with like skyline logging for thinning some of these areas that have been terraced. And, and basically, it's kind of the idea of if you have a historic farm, can you continue to farm it in ways, you know, kind of akin to that historic nature? Uh, you know, that was some of the arguments that we kind of use about what do we do with this? And then we also identified a portion at the upper end of Took Creek, about 150 acres, that we said we're going to do um, a hand thinning action. And then we're going to set this aside and do interpretation. So if you want to come to the Video National Forest and see a wonderful cultural landscape, you can see the terracing in the 1960s. Now, I've worked on projects in the past, mine tailings, and I was accused of, you want to just save these, you know, horrible mine tailings that devastated the river. But it's like Dr. Fiji said, it's not my place to judge whether it's right or wrong now. And it's almost more important to save at least a portion of it to show this is what has been occurred in the past and these are the bad decisions or how we view them now versus how we'll view them in the future. No doubt in the future, they'll look back upon, you know, some of the projects that have occurred and say, those guys didn't have it right and gals, you know, they should have done it like this. That's always how these things continue to evolve. Um, so we're gonna do interpretation. And then part of the thing that we do as well is presentations like this. Uh, we're presenting at, um, you know, state historical society uh, conferences, going to the Northwest regional conferences, and then hoping to get on with uh, either the SAAs or the SHAs as well to kind of bring this to light, share it with the public and, and share kind of even, you know, the black eyes or the or the uh, not so positive parts of the agency. We're, we're always good about sharing the good things, but as the historians and archaeologists here, you know, we like to present it impartially, both sides of it. So that's basically here. 
Uh, you can find more information on the Mud Creek Vegetation Management Project as well as other NEPA projects that are being undertaken on the Bitterroot National Forest on our website. And you can also pretty much find it on Google. Thanks.